Yeah. So what I've seen with the marketing campaign with hypoglossal nerve stimulation, namely Inspire, you know, you the patients see a commercial and they see, oh, some joke about snoring at the dinner table and then click a button, OSA is gone, no mask, no hose, just sleep. And these people come out of the woodwork and I've been seeing patients who said, yeah, my last sleep study was 20 years ago. When's the last time you wore a CPAP? 19 years ago. What have you been doing since then? I've been sleeping in a recliner in a separate room and I'm miserable and I take a nap every day for four hours and my boss is about to lay me off or something like that. But the, the burden of untreated OSA, as Keith is referring to, is absolutely enormous. I don't think that similar in a similar way to bariatric surgery, I heard a bariatric surgeon tell me one time, we're not going to operate our way out of the obesity epidemic. In the same way, I don't think we're going to operate ourselves out of the OSA epidemic. But this is where the role of the nose is huge because we can recognize that. And that may be the barrier to treatment that can get a lot of patients back in the game of being treated with their OSA. So whether that be getting back on CPAP or whether that be a bridge to other CPAP alternatives, it's additive therapy. And again, a perfect correlate with head and neck cancer. I'm not trying to say that OSA is cancer, but the way that we learned how to treat head and neck cancer was if you have a head and neck cancer, we diagnose it and we treat it. And if it recurs or you get a second one, then we don't say, hey, we gave it a shot. Sorry, you're dead. We say, hey, work through salvage therapy or let's do, let's do something else. So that's the way. And even, even it, it parallels on my notes. This is my treatment history for OSA with this patient. So the way I say it is if you're going to be on CPAP, we can dial up the CPAP and we can blow it away. But if we're going to do something else, then we're going to get it as best as we can. And it might not be one thing. It might be a treatment course. Multi-level, right? Yeah, no, multi-level. And then the nose will only help whatever else we decide to do, if any. Well, the literature says that 70%, up to 70% of OSA patients have significant nasal obstruction. And I find that certainly before we had some of the modern therapies, which we'll talk about over the next few minutes, I'm sure, we, even as otolaryngologists, ignored it other than looking at a deviated septum. And I will pause here, our friends at the third party payers, you know, friends in air quotes, they love to dissociate certainly a deviated nasal septum, but really any nasal airway obstruction from OSA to the point that you have to be careful documenting those ICD-10s in the same note because one may deny care for the other. And yet, as I always say on this topic, the nose is central literally and figuratively in sleep disorder breathing. And so I guess, Ashwin, my question to you is, since you trained much more recently, how much were they hammering home nasal obstruction as you were looking at sleep disorders? Or I guess even more, when you were training with the non-otolaryngologists, the psychiatrists and the pulmonologists, what did they pay any attention to nasal obstruction or, or was it complete mystery to them? Well, here we go with the bias, right? So if you're looking at a nose with an otoscope, then <laughs> you're not going to see it right. You know, you got to look with the speculum and you got to have to look at a lot of noses. And, and, and that's what we do best as otolaryngologists. We're able to look at our physical exam and understand what we're seeing and correlate that with what the patients are saying. So yeah, you know, the, the, in my fellowship, the neurologists and the psychiatrists and the pulmonologists that I train with were much, much better at managing medications than I was. But even during my fellowship, they'd say, what do you think about that nose? Do you think that this is that? And I'd be like, no, that's not that. And, uh, so anyway, I think that there is, I think that the emphasis has to come from us because I mean, any otolaryngologist has in practice has been referred a patient for nasal polyps and it's the inferior turbinate. You have to be able to look at it and understand what's going on. So is their nose contributing to a patient's intolerance of CPAP? Is their nose contributing to mouth breathing? Is their nose contributing to arousal threshold where they're not breathing well through their nose, they kind of choke and wake up and that's, con that's making them have a hard time getting into deep sleep. So the nasal exam, there's no different nasal exam for sleep than there is for any other thing, I think. 
just look in their nose and, and you'll know what to do. Yeah, true. Yeah. Keith, can I can we go back to your comments on third party payers not or, you know, disassociating like a deviated septum or nasal obstruction with OSA? Like so you're yeah. saying like if if someone had both diagnoses, then that could be problematic for for coverage of certain procedures? Yeah. What I've noticed, it's anecdotal, you know, I'm not claiming to be Karen Zupko here, but I, I know a little bit about reimbursement. And if there's this patient that all I've really found of significance on their physical exam is a deviated nasal septum, perhaps some nasal valve collapse, but I also have the ICD-10 of OSA, whether I made that diagnosis or they came in with it, I've had many, many septoplasties denied because that is not an accepted treatment for OSA. Oh, wow. Even though I'm treating the deviated nasal septum, just having that ICD-10 in the list, I've had them denied. So I've learned to be very careful and dissociate them at least by 90 days. I mean, again, it's a game. I try to always be real on these these podcasts. I mean, that's that's what it's like to really practice medicine nowadays. It's a game and a frustrating game that the rules change every 90 days. But but what I do is usually I'll, I'll ask the patient, okay, what do you want me to address first? If you want me to do a home sleep test and evaluate your, your sleep, let's do that first and we'll deal with your nose later. But what I vote for is, especially now that we know so much about the contribution of nasal airway obstruction, I say, let me treat your nose first, heal up from that, whatever we do, and then let's do the diagnostics because you're going to be better. And then we can make some good clinical decisions if we need to do anything in addition. Got it. So that's at least how I handle it, Ashley. 